is the term that was given to the presidency of James Monroe, uh, 1816, 1824. It was a, a time of kind of national unity where America was, was kind of, you know, uh, you know, Americans were, were on the same page. Um, a lot of that had to do with the War of 1812, right? Wars usually unite a country. Um, there was only one political party, the Democratic Republican Party, so there was not a lot of political turmoil. But even that party had um, some 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 um, some factions that disagreed on certain issues. So sometimes, you know, the idea of an era of good feelings, at least politically speaking, um, is a misleading term. Uh, Democratic Republicans had debates over tariffs, the National Bank, internal improvements, and what to do over, you know, uh, uh, slavery. Um, you know, it's it's probably a better term to describe or to detail our country from 1816 to 1819. After 1819. You're going to see more political, more political conflict and, and, and you know rising sectionalism. All right, so Monroe is the last of the Virginia dynasty that included Washington, Jefferson, and Madison. He won the election unanimously in 1816 and 1824. You know more evidence that this was a unified nation where we were not really debating a lot politically. Um, it's also a time of growth where we acquired Florida. Um, and foreign policy was significant, or at least the Monroe Doctrine was, was a significant foreign policy achievement, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so, you know, in terms of this, this idea of nationalism, um, again, it means that our country was coming together, whether it was, you know, we, we weren't really that divided politically, uh, we were, you know, uh, economically, we were, we were, you know, the different sections of the country were were connected, and even culturally, right, where, where Americans were, were, you know, it didn't matter if you were in, in Virginia or South Carolina or New York, we were kind of on the same page. Our, our culture was very similar. Um, again, d didn't matter where you lived. Um, Americans were more involved in politics than ever before. We were, we were participating politically, which is important. No single part of the country had more political fervor than the other. Um, we were, you know, doing well economically. Um, we were expanding westward, so Americans from all parts of the country were moving west. Um, art, education was promoting our, 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 our themes, our, our, our ideology of democracy and, and freedom. Um, you know, our, our founding fathers were now being glorified. We would see them in paintings. Um, you know, they were, they were becoming kind of our, 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 our role models, right? They were, they were gone, you know, Washington and, and at least George Washington and John Adams, um, and Thomas Jefferson, you know, are going to not be around during this time. Um, Jefferson is going to, and Adams will pass away, you know, in 1820, 1821, Washington is gone. So these men are going to become immortalized, um, more and more Americans are going to be reading American literature. Um, we're even going to have uh, an American dictionary, Noah Webster, that promotes you know uh, American culture and patriotism. So that that's an important piece. Um, we're becoming more unified culturally, right, economically. Um, we were more interconnected as well. Um, Southerners were trading with Northerners. Westerners were trading with Easterners. Um, you know, each part of the country was, was, was connected. And a lot of that had to do with new transportation networks like roads and canals. And um, we were becoming more, more independent economically, especially from a manufacturing standpoint. A lot of that had to do with tariffs. So definitely be familiar with that term, what a tariff is. It's a tax on foreign manufactured goods. Um, if you make goods coming in from England more expensive, Americans will buy American. Um, so that's going to kind of help American companies compete with foreign companies. And, and for the most part, Southerners and Westerners did, did support those tariffs. But as time would go on, Southerners would be less um, interested in tariffs just because they believed that, you know, in free trade. Um, they wanted um, the cheaper goods that were coming in from Europe. Um, so that would become a source of political tension as time would go on. 
All right, the American system, very important. I underlined it, definitely want to be familiar with this term. Uh, this, is, this was a, a, um, a program developed by Henry Clay of Kentucky, very important, historically speaking. And the idea was to, to again, nationalize our country economically um, and also promote more manufacturing. Um, again, that's still part of nationalism, a national economy where we're not dependent necessarily on Europe. So tariffs were important to the American system. Um, a national bank was important. The idea of having a, a, an American bank that could provide you know, a national currency, could, could loan uh, federal money to uh, smaller state banks, right? Um, obviously would hold uh, tax revenue. Um, and this idea that, that the federal government would fund national projects. It would help all parts of the country. And those were known as internal improvements, whether it was a canal or a road, a bridge, anything like that um, would be funded by tax dollars to promote trade and transportation, um, especially, you know, going west. Um, but, you know, conservative Democratic Republicans like Monroe and Madison were concerned about that. You know, they, it goes back to those old, you know, Democratic Jeffersonian ideals of of the government's too strong. Um, you know, the idea of spending, you know, southern tax dollars on a northern internal improvement was just something that would eventually um, spark a lot of discussion, debate, and, um, you know, was definitely a, a, a factor in, in calls even for secession later on. The idea of, um, you know, the federal government becoming too strong um, over the states. All right, uh, you should be familiar with some of these panics. So there are several. Um, a panic is kind of like a depression. Um, and, and these panics were significant um, in a lot of ways. Uh, the first panic was in 1819. Um, you could use it to argue that this was really not necessarily a true era of good feelings. Um, you know, there was an economic downturn. A lot of it had to do with, with the banking system. Uh, the Bank of the United States was loaning a little bit less to state banks to control inflation. They didn't want a lot of money in circulation. And because of that, some state banks that relied on those loans ended up closing. Uh, when banks close, you, you're going to have um, a domino effect. And as time would go on, you'd see rising unemployment, um, bankruptcy uh, from you know, businesses, um, and even uh, Americans would start to go to jail for unpaid debt. So um, it didn't happen overnight, but over time, um, there was an economic downturn. Uh, it was most severe in the West, as a lot of farmers went into debt due to lower prices. Uh, inflation is not good for a farmer. And just overall, not as much demand for goods. Um, so that's a problem. And because of that, uh, there was a lot of farm foreclosure, whether it was a state bank or even the Bank of the United States um, closing those farms. And that's going to kind of you know, uh, lead down the road to the, to the emergence of Andrew Jackson. Um, he's going to play on that, that, that tension between the banking system and, and the farming community. All right, so uh, some political changes. The Federalist Party is out. Um, their anti-war uh, sentiment, the calls for secession by New Englanders, kind of, you know, kind of was, was, was detrimental and eventually... The Federalists um, died out, and um, you'd have a single political party with factions. Those those Federalists didn't just stop politicking, right? They they kind of again uh, developed a faction in the Democratic Republican. Um, but overall, the Federalist Party just was seen as being out out of step with this nationalistic temper of the times. All right, so the Democratic Republicans again the only party during the era of good feelings. There were divisions. Um, there was kind of an old school group, an old school faction that continued to promote states' rights. They were Jeffersonian in, in, in many ways, a limited federal government, strict interpretation of the Constitution. And then the new school segment, this new school faction, which was probably, you know, you're going to see those, those Federalists, um, you know, be part of this faction. And they did support a large military, a national bank and tariff. So, you know, you only have one political party, but those factions were still there. Um, and as time would go on, you know, the, the, the Democratic Republican Party would, would break off into a, a second party, uh, the Whig Party eventually. Uh, and the Whig Party would be developed or would emerge to combat um, Andrew Jackson. Um, so that would again, uh, uh, th this party wouldn't remain singular for very long. Um, all right, so from a judicial standpoint, the, the, the Supreme Court did a lot to nationalize our country. Um, 
you know, their decisions, and we mentioned this in chapter seven, strengthen the powers of the federal government over the states, and that's nationalizing, right? Strengthening the national government. McCullough versus Maryland, that was mentioned earlier in 1819. The state of Maryland tried to tax the second bank of the United States, but John Marshall and the Supreme Court ruled that states could not tax a federal institution. And all that did is it strengthened this idea that federal laws were supreme over state laws. And it just reinforced that even though it's not in the Constitution, a federal bank was constitutional. And that's an example, again, of, 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 of our country nationalizing, right, where the, the federal government was really wielding a lot of power. All right, so let's talk about going west. A western settlement was, was growing. Why were Americans moving west? One, we were acquiring American Indian land through treaties and, ter and, 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 and um, through treaties. There was a lot of economic pressure in the south and east. Um, you know, I think that if you're a laborer, you know, if you're working in, in, in Philadelphia or New York, you see more opportunity in the West to maybe own a farm or a small business. So um, if you're a, a poor farmer in the South, maybe you don't own land or, or you have very, your land, the land you own is, is, is withering away or deteriorating. Perhaps, you know, you move West to find better land for your, for your, your, your crops. Um, also, better transportation, the railroad, um, canals, better roads help Americans move west um, easily and more cheaply. Um, and that land was pretty cheap. It wasn't easy to get there. You weren't getting off a boat and hopping on a train. It took, it took a while to save that money up. But immigrants did have this dream, and many of them eventually would move west and um, <clears throat> settle in the west over time. Didn't happen overnight. All right, uh, so there was a big issue as we started to grow um, in the West. There was this question of what do we do with slavery in the new territory? Remember the, the Northwest Ordinance said that there was no slavery north of the Ohio River. Well, we're going past the Ohio River now. We're, you know, with the Louisiana Purchase, we have territory in Missouri and Kansas and Nebraska and Iowa, um, even in the South into Oklahoma. What do we do? Is that territory slave or is that territory free? Um, Southerners wanted to see uh, the, the cotton economy grow. Um, land in the East was uh, cotton farm or cotton soil was being uh, withered away. That's what you know over farming does. So a lot of farmers said, "We want to go west and find more land." Um, Westerners, though, a small farmer in the West, didn't necessarily want to see slavery expand into their part into their territory. Uh, an Iowa farmer didn't want to compete with a large plantation staffed with slaves. Um, they just wouldn't be able to compete. Uh, Lincoln, you know, didn't love slavery uh, from a moral standpoint, but he also saw what it did to his father. His father was a, a farmer in Illinois, and he couldn't compete with the Kentucky farmers who had slaves. So Lincoln kind of, you know, was against slavery for economic reasons as well, not just moral reasons. Um, so in 1819, a, a big issue pops up is Missouri. Missouri has enough uh, people in it to apply for statehood. Um, slavery was in existence there, so there was an issue. What do we do? Um, understand the context is there was sectional balance at the time in 1819. The North might have had more representation in the House, but when it came to the Senate, it was 11 and 11. There were 11 slave states and there were 11 free states. That means 22 senators, 11 on both sides. Um, or sorry, 22 senators, um, sorry, 22 states, 44 senators. So there were 11 free, uh, free states, 11 uh, slave states. That meant, again, 22 senators that supported slavery and 22 senators that, you know, maybe didn't want to see it extend. Um, Southern senators, so, so, you know, anyone who has that advantage, if, the, if southern states have an advantage in the Senate, they could block northern legislation that maybe they didn't agree with, like tariffs or anti-slavery measures. Or maybe they didn't believe that they should be funding internal improvements in the north. Um, or they looked down on the bus, uh, perhaps. So um, this was a big issue. You know, northerners wanted to, 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 to advance those American system programs, and southerners were kind of concerned about those programs. All right, so what do we do? What happened with Missouri? Uh, Missouri applies for statehood, as I mentioned, um, and and it did bring up this question: What do we do with the rest of the Louisiana Purchase Territory? So um, there was an amendment that emerged early on. Um, it would prohibit the induction of slavery into Missouri. Uh, 
Um, and those who were those slaves that were in Missouri, um, children would be free at 25. But Southerner, the Southern Senate was able to block it. You know, when you have an even, um, when you have an even amount, you don't have the majority. So the vote usually went into the you know, the vote blocked that amendment. But it's an attempt. Um, you would you probably don't have to remember this historically speaking as something you'd have in your notes. But just understand there were attempts by Congress to to kind of compromise, um, or at least in this case to abolish slavery. I apologize to abolish slavery. Um, but the Missouri Compromise ends up being the legislation. Definitely remember this. Put it down in your notebook. Henry Clay of Kentucky comes up with a new compromise. Um, he was known as the Great Compromiser. That wasn't necessarily a great thing all the time. They kind of would just kick the can down the road in terms of the slave issue. But he basically came up with a plan to admit Missouri as a slave state. Uh, Vermont, the territory or the lands of Vermont would be divided into Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, and Maine would be admitted as a free state. And then a line was drawn in the new territory, the Louisiana Territory, where north of that 3630 line would be free, and south of that 3630 line would be um, basically Arkansas Territory, um, would be, um, could be slave, slave territory. And that settled things for a while. Um, you know, uh, sectional or, or, or you know these tensions did subside until the 1840s um but i think it was it didn't go away uh, even thomas jefferson said that that the slave issue was like a fire bell in the night he, he saw that you know john quincy adams um also uh, was concerned that these compromises or comp this compromise wasn't really solving the problem and that eventually um you know, uh, major problems would, would, would occur, and they were right, right? Uh, the fire bell, you know, the, the fire did emerge with the Civil War. Um, so Jefferson was very, um, was very, uh, was a visionary. He, he saw that, that the slave issue needed to be dealt with uh, sooner rather than later. All right, what about foreign affairs? Uh, following the War of 1812, uh, Madison uh, adopted a more a nationalistic approach, um, uh, I wouldn't say interventionism, but um, kind of saying, "Hey, America is not going to stand by, and we're going to push, push our. We're going to, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to be tough if we have to be tough." Uh, Madison and John Quincy Adams. Uh, at Quin John Quincy Adams was uh, Monroe's um, Secretary of State. Uh, they continued to follow a policy that advanced American interests. Um, so that's the idea, right? A foreign policy that benefited America not necessarily, um, you know, their allies, or we weren't really just kind of hiding our, hiding, hiding, hiding ourselves. Um, so we did have um, the rush Bago agreement, agreement, 1817, I would remember it, kind of calm things down with, with England. Um, going forward, we would have a positive relationship. Um, it, li it limited naval armaments in the Great Lakes. Remember, uh, England does control Canada. Um, and it finally established a northern border, what we have today. And that's important. So it kind of reduces tensions with England going forward. Uh, Treaty of 1818, I wouldn't remember it, but just understand what's happening. Uh, our, our relationship with British is improving, and that's important going forward. They would become more of an ally. Uh, Florida. We do uh, obtain Florida from Spain uh, with the adams onis Treaty. That's John Adams as Secretary of State. Um, you know, a little background, Andrew Jackson initiates a war with the Seminole Indians, and it was kind of done on purpose. Um, we blame the Spanish for their inability to control attacks on the people of Georgia, and we use that to justify military action. And, you know, we kind of started a little mini war with Spain without directly declaring war with Spain. Eventually, the Spanish just said they didn't want to deal, and they sold the territory. We did agree, though, to give up territorial claims to Texas, and that was important. Because at this time, around 1819, the Spanish did control Texas. That wouldn't last very long. But um, we kind of basically temporarily gave up any interest in that territory, and we acquired um, Florida. All right, so the Monroe Doctrine is very important. Uh, so understand what's happening. Uh, new monarchies are emerging in, um, in Europe. And um, basically, uh, you know, the, the, the whole South American continent is, is, has been colonized by Spain. Um, you know, England is no longer a threat, but 
countries like Russia were. Russia's presence in Alaska um, was a concern. Um, not that they would invade the United States, but we were concerned about that Northwest Territory, which is today Washington and even Oregon. Um, so we had to kind of set, draw a line in the sand, and we did. And James Monroe established a doctrine. Um, basically, it was a statement, and we warned all European powers to stay away from the Americas. Um, basically, limit co colonization and imperialism, and we did threaten military action if they got too close. And it's really the beginning of U.S. interventionist policy, where we, even though we were kind of promoting this idea of freedom in the Americas, um, we were basically saying that this region is under our influence and everyone should kind of stay out. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt would kind of re-echo the, the statement in his Roosevelt Corollary. All right, let's talk about the market revolution. Um, you know, this is a, a, a definitely, this is great evidence to support that argument that it was an era of good feelings. A lot of economic prosperity. There's no doubting that, that our, our country was growing and prospering. Um, so population was booming between 1800 and 1825. Our population doubled. A lot of it had to do with just higher birth rates. Uh, children were living, um, were living through infancy. That's important. Um, it's not that people were, were dying at, at, at or, or dying at later ages. It's that children were, were surviving and, and living longer lives, right? So um, birth rates were, were, were growing. Um, immigration also contributed that. Uh, immigrants from England and Germany were pouring into this country. A lot of it had to do with, with land restrictions in Europe. Um, the non-white population actually declined. So even though slavery existed, remember the slave trade was abolished in 1807. So slavers were not being brought into this country. Um, but obviously slavery was still very important. A third of Americans were living in the West, um, west of the Appalachians and west of the Allegheny Mountains. In, you know, states like Indiana, Michigan, Ohio. But uh, urban populations were growing as well. All right, so you know, what's happening during this market revolution. Um, you know, new transportation is emerging, roads, a uh, 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 paved road, not paved roads, sorry, uh, roads that could handle a lot of transport, uh, carriages, carts, cargoes. Uh, the Lancaster Turnpike was the first toll road that went through Pennsylvania. Um, obviously, a toll road is what we have today. Um, states, you know, states' rights supporters in the Democratic Republican Party weren't thrilled about using federal dollars to build national roads. There were a few that crossed state lines, like the National Road and the Cumberland Road, both were in Maryland. But you're not going to see, you know, like, uh, you know, a road that goes from, say, New York to, to Missouri. And that had a lot to do with, again, resistance um, by, by Southerners, um, who just didn't think that federal dollars should go to you know, do, supporting projects that really didn't benefit those states. Um, canals were being built. The Erie Canal was the most important. Uh, that connected New York City to the, the Great Lakes. Uh, if you were a farmer in the Great Lakes or, uh, you know, on the coast of uh, Ohio or Michigan or in Michigan or Ohio, you could now, or Minnesota, you could now transport your goods to eastern cities like Boston and New York. Um, also railroads, uh, you know, early railroads, um, mostly in the east, um, would compete with canals and eventually overtake canals as the main mode of transportation. And because of that, cities like Cleveland, Detroit, and Chicago, which were more, you know, agricultural uh, towns and cities, would become major commercial centers. All right, so industry is going to grow during this time uh, for a variety of factors. One, uh, better technology. Um, you're going to be able to, uh, with the invention of the interchangeable part by Eli Whitney, this idea that you can manufacture a, a gun, for example, with, with parts, right? So basically the idea is you could, you know, have a factory with workers and each worker had a specialized task, whether it was putting a shoe together or a gun or, or any kind of, you know, finished product. Um, also state law. State laws, especially in New York, made it easier to form a large corporation uh, a business could could incorporate, you know, bring in stockholders, raise capital. Um, that's important. And the factory system. Samuel Slater is going to come over from England with his innovation, uh, basically build a factory. Um, and in this factory, you're going to have lots of workers, um, machines that that basically 
you know, use the idea of interchangeable parts. We're not looking at cars yet, but we're talking about maybe finished goods like shoes, um, rifles, um, you know, not, not, not really modern industrial products, but, but products that are, are still, you know, clothing, definitely clothing, textiles. Tariffs are going uh, to help that prosper. And a lot of these factories are going to uh, emerge in New England. And basically, you know, instead of having things made at home in, in a family environment, now people are going to work in a factory um, on an assembly line. And that's important, right? Uh, prior to the market revolution, things were made by hand in the home. Um, it's called the putting out system. Um, and now you're going to see things made by machine or at least uh, in factories. Uh, New England has water power, whether it's a, a river to, to generate you know, steam, a mill, or seaport just to transport goods back to Europe. And, and also there was a decline in farming in New England, um, overuse of land, um, better land in the West. So a lot of these farmers that didn't have those farms or those jobs would, would be perfect for these factories. Uh, you still had agriculture. Agriculture was still the dominant um, economic industry. Large farms, especially in the South, with a cash crop like cotton. Uh, land was pretty cheap, and credit was pretty easy to get from a bank. Um, new technologies, too. Better plows were emerging to help farmers. Um, and the canals and trains helped farmers move their goods further east, and that's important. All right, so... A good definition for the market revolution would be one, you know, large commercial farms or specialization on the farm. Um, this idea of, of, of a farm with many workers, not a family farm per se. Obviously, cities were growing. Uh, factories were emerging um, with new technologies. Uh, and again, it's the end of the self-sufficient household where you basically made your own clothing, or maybe you made clothing in the house and sold it, right, like a small business. Um, you would basically live in your home, eat, sleep, drink, and then leave for work, and you would go work in a factory. Um, and everyone was interconnected, right? Farmers would feed the workers who provided farm families with mass-produced goods. So pretty easy definition, remember, but it's happening during this era of good feelings, you know, the 1820s. All right, what was the effect? Uh, standard of living improved, right? Better products. Um, women were finding work, and that's important. It's empowering them, giving them a sense of independence. Mostly single women. They wouldn't be working very long. Eventually, they would be married. Um, but that's important. This is going to be, you know, influencing the, the suffrage movement, which is to come, where women would start to, you know, ask for the right to vote. Uh, mobility, social mobility, economic mobility. People would, would be were making more money. Wages were growing slowly. Um, overall, though, you still had a large poor class and a, a small rich class, and the gap was pretty extreme. Um, you know, a small farmer, a, a worker in a, in a factory was not going to be a millionaire overnight. Um, but I think the middle class, you know, you're going to have, you know, accountants, you're going to have managers emerge. You're going to have more middle class jobs emerge. Um, and those workers were making money even if they weren't in management. And that's important. Uh, slavery was just as important. Maybe not as many slaves, but, but slaves were still important to the national economy. Cotton was still one of the major exporters of this country. Those factories in New England were relying on southern cotton. So, you know, slaves were, were making, you know, uh, northern factory owners were making money off the backs of slaves, no doubt. All right, that's it, guys.